So this evening, doing my Till Death Do Us part portfolio, uh, we've been sort of promoting this for a bit. Um, there were the two podcasts on uh, JC Direct that detailed them. This was from when I was on leave. And the point was, I needed to create content you know, in advance. I didn't know Brexit was going to happen. That obviously had all sorts of fun and games in the, in, in the, in the process. Uh, but Brexit did happen nonetheless. So... The two podcasts went out. The first one was uh, Finding Awesome Stocks, in which I use Porter's Forces, uh, Five Forces, and then a look at my portfolio. Now, this being the follow-up as to, you know, let's engage, let's take any critiques. Interestingly, only really one critique on the portfolio. It was Famous Brands, um, and the critique was, you know, just like, really, you own Famous Brands? And uh, the answer was yes, and then nothing more to it. So we won't get too excited about that. Um or too concerned. Those are <clears throat> the stocks. Importantly, we are recording this on 13 July. I needed to check my calendar quick. Uh, and that portfolio obviously is potentially dynamic. Uh, my portfolio is updated live at uh, my vanity site, summonbrown.coza slash portfolio. Um, and we're only focusing on my to death dress part. There are second tier stocks. There are obviously ETFs as well and the like. So part of the process was to throw this out there stick out my stocks and say, you know, what does everyone think? Uh, as I said, you know, the two which I had the deepest uh, uh, concerns about, or maybe the lowest level of conviction, to put it another way around, was Sassel and Billiton. Uh, they remain on my concern list. And what I do when stocks are on a concern list, I basically don't buy them uh, until I've decided one way or the other. So I'm not entering uh, new cash into either of those two. Uh, the only one that got queried, as I said, was Famous Brands. Um, and, and I'm, you know, what often happens is I buy a stock for my second tier, famous brands, about, this was, I don't know, 10 or so years ago. I really liked the look of it, but I didn't know that they could do what they were promising to do. So it goes into my second tier portfolio and we wait and see for want of a better phrase. And they did. They absolutely proved themselves and more and they get upgraded into till death do us part. Um, the Porter's Five Forces, a quick refresh on that, on how I get to the stocks. So the first part of the process is identifying those shares that I like and saying, you know, which do I like? I run through this uh, and then I go off and, and find that price. Um, in terms of price, there are two theories to price. The one is you just buy. So there are some portfolio managers, uh, Vestac springs to mind, who basically say, you know what, this is our model portfolio and you just buy the shares. You know, and they've got stocks in there, for example, NASPAS. If you're waiting for NASPAS to be cheap, it ain't ever going to happen. It ain't ever going to happen. I mean, never say never, but, but you know, it, it's going to be a long, long time until it is going to happen. Um, and, and, and so, the, the, you know, and so you get some dirty entry points in terms of what you pay. But my concern around that, and I'm, I'm toying with the idea, my concern around it is fairly simple. There are two things we can control in the market. The one is what we buy, and the second is the price we pay. We have no control over anything else. What the earnings of the company will be, how it will grow into the future, uh, what the market will do with the price, what the local and global economy, exchange rates, interest rates, and all of those type of issues, Brexits and you know, Trump elections, I've got no control over that. So I've always been very specific as to price that I pay. Um, it served me well. It, it does mean that at, you know, particularly top of bull markets at time, I'm not buying much. But what I've typically find is that there's, well, I'm going to say there's a couple. There's sometimes one or two, you know, stocks that are offering value. But, you know, in 2007, when I had, I'll be honest, a less uh, rigid process and the like, it's certainly come on a lot since then. Um, not much really, really met my criteria in terms of price. So a lot to be said for buy it. Don't stress it. But at this point, we do stress it. So I buy when cheap. So what's cheap? So we can go do discount cash flows. We can go do, you know, Gordon discount uh, dividend models and the like. And those are complicated and hard and prone to error. And I'm trying to be lazy here. So I, I do a, a fairly simple uh, process. What I'm essentially doing is I take a forward price earnings and buy when that is below the seven year PE average. So forward price earnings is taking the next year's expected earnings from consensus forecast, putting it into today's price. And when that price earnings is below the seven-year average, I go and buy. Uh, so that's the 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 10-second version. I uploaded a video onto the Just One Lap website today. There is the link, justonelap.com slash what-price-pay. 
um, and there you will find the video. And it goes into a lot more detail around uh, not just price, but margins and the like. So I'm very much looking at, 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 at that as my methodology to determine what price to pay. So it gives me indications. And if I quickly go back to this screen here, uh, that one there, stocks that are currently in my buy zone space is Woolies, is Richmond, is uh, Discovery, is Famous Brands. Um, Bulletin and Sassel are off, as I said, for now, ShopRite too expensive, Metrofile, yeah, I, I might pay up. I didn't get my full allocation of Metrofile. You know, you want X. I got 75% of X. Um, the dividend yield might make me break my rules. But at this point, it's you know technically too expensive. Uh, City Lodge, Ditto, Capitec, Ditto. Um, but certainly, so on, on the buying at current levels, I'm buying Discovery, I'm uh, buying Richmond, uh, and buying Woolies. And quite happily so, you know. And yeah. I bought some Richmonts at, what was it, 96, 98, uh, and some more in the lower 90s and some more in the higher 80s. And if it carries on falling, I've got more bids in the market. So I get a price I like. And then I say, so say the price I like on Woolies, I think it was 80, 250, 85 Rand. So I put the bid in and then I drop a bid in, you know, three bucks lower and another three bucks below that and another three bucks below that. And I just stagger bids. I think I've got a bid as low in Woolies as 68. Um, I hope, I, actually, I don't hope, I don't care where if it goes there or not. In fact, if it does go there, it would be really, really cool because I'll pick up some really quality stock at really, really good price. So that's my methodology for paying. I want to dig around this just by some more, and, and there's some reasons into it. Um, you know, it's one thing to show the portfolio, but that's useless. The question is, as a number of people asked me, what price do we pay? And so I'm thinking of perhaps on my website, where I've got the portfolio is also including the price that I'm currently willing to pay. And those numbers are changing, you know, so the forward PE is changing on a regular basis, but I update them on a on a six monthly basis um, in terms of, of, of the forward PE. And then obviously as a result come the historic PE. So that's enough about that. The question, when do we sell? So that's really, really simple. It's a fundamental fundamental exit. It is not a price based exit, not at all, at all, at all. Um, so you know, I hold Shoprider when it was two hundred and twenty, and it went all the way down to one hundred and twenty and change, um, <clears throat> and I didn't sell for a second. Um, I would have loved to have sold Shoprider two twenty and bought at one twenty eight or wherever it went. The truth is, I have zero expectation of getting that even a fraction right. So it's like you know, I'm just not going to bother, just not going to bother at all, at all. So it's not a price base. What I'm doing. As, as I'm doing that process, I love the stock. I'm going through porters. I'm making notes. I'm old school. I do pieces of paper still, and I file them away in a cupboard and hope it never burns down. Um, what were my key reasons? What were my top three reasons for buying this stock? Are those reasons still in force? And if the answer is, is yes, they're still there, I hold it. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I hold pick and pay for a while in the 90s and into early 2000s. And you could see them starting to lose their way. One of the reasons I'd like pick and pay was a uh, dominant supermarket chain, which is an abstract concept, but nonetheless, uh, and dominant uh, uh, operating margins compared to their peers. What was happening was uh, ShopRite was picking up uh, market share. Pick and pay weren't losing, but they were, you know, who was losing was hard to tell. But ShopRite was certainly picking up market share quicker. Um, they had their Australian debacle and they also, uh, their margins started shrinking and I couldn't see any concern from management. So I sold them. I, I got out and I, I can't remember the price I exited at and I, I switched into ShopRite and, and that was an inspired one. They're not always as inspired as that. But the point is I'm not worried about the price of the share because ideally in a perfect world, this is a death to us part. I, I hold until death. Um, either I die or the company dies, but you know the simpler route would be I die. Um, so if those reasons start to be breached, then I will be exiting. Otherwise, I'm not. I do not stress price weakness. I just go buy more. The risk is then you get overweight, <clears throat> and I want to touch on this a bit. So let's say I've got ten stocks and I make them each ten percent of my portfolio, uh, and that's nice and simple. And then one of them is Capitec, and it goes from. 40 Rand where I first bought it to 600 Rand and it is no longer 10% of my portfolio. A couple of things will happen. I'm probably not buying more Capitec because it's become expensive. So I'm buying the stocks that have shrunk in weight to a degree because of price coming down and the like. But Capitec then becomes massively massive in, 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 in the portfolio. And, and 
so how do I manage that? Um, so what I've done, I mean, with Capitex, a perfect example. Whenever they've given me uh, no paid letters, I've sold them. I sold Capitex at 125, again at 175, uh, and again at 175 um, to lighten the load. And then it ran, and then when Abel crashed, I, bought, I picked up some at 200. And then I was chatting with Garth McKenzie at the expo over this past weekend. And we've all got, we've both got stories about stocks that we sold because we feared we were overweight. And the short answer is, I mean, we shouldn't have. I mean, that's just the, the honest truth. Um, so I'm going to dig into that. I'm going to start stressing less about being overweight. You know, what's the problem? So Capitec runs and you want to protect those profits. Uh, and Capitec an extreme example. Let's take ShopRite. You know, it, it ran to 220. Um, my average entry at that point was about 30 odd rand. You want to protect that seven bagger. Um, so you sell some to protect it. But that kind of defeats the whole purpose of it, then it becomes to a death to us part or you get expensive, whichever the case may be. Um, and that kind of defeats it. So I, I, I'm going to ponder this, but I think my view is, you know, what, if I go overweight, I manage it because there's also new money coming in. Dividends are coming in, maybe sales uh, and cash I deposit and the like. So I'm going to stop stressing the overweight part. Uh, Jade, you ask, where do you get the forward PE information from? So my stock broker, I'm currently using standard online share trading. They have consensus data. Uh, but I think I think it's Reuters also has consensus data for South African stocks. So you go to Reuters.com. I think it's Reuters. Uh, Reuters.com and go, and maybe it's Bloomberg. I think Bloomberg you pay. Uh, but try both and go, you know, you search the company you're looking for. And they've got them listed and they then have the consensus data as well, which tells you. So that tells you what the earnings are expected to be for the next financial year. Of course, if you use it, you take the risk of it. And the risk is that they're wrong. Um, that's fine. I'm happy with that risk. So. Uh, then risk management. So I'm not doing 2% position sizes. As I said, I'm trying to keep them equal weight. Um, and typically what I'm doing is 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 I'm, I'm buying it a set rand value. So, you know, I'm, if I want to buy a new share, there's a minimum amount I want to buy. I said a moment ago for Metrofile that I'd wanted X and I only got 75% of X. There's a, a particular amount that I want to want to buy. But, you know, the risk management is done a couple of ways. I've got the core portfolio of ETFs which is now sitting at about 52, yeah, about 52%. That manages most of my risk in that sense there. Um, I've got about 30% in this death to us part portfolio, 10% or so in my second tiers, which is currently Calgro, Santova, and mine have gone blank on the third one. Um, not important. And then, uh, and then I've got my 10%, which goes into momentum, uh, lazy, and uh, Aussie trading. So that, that then sits the top end of the pyramid, so to speak. Um, but I'm not, you know, 2% is very much a trading concept and managing it in, in, in that sense. If I'm doing this half right, I'm not stressed. I mean, the best thing is you buy a share and uh, with my Metro file. So my average entry on Metro file, I think, is 396. Um, I got lucky. Someone dumped some shares at me at 380. Um, and it almost immediately runs, and now it's 480, and I look like a genius, 20% in, in six months. But, you know, my discovery shares, I think, are probably still a break-even, um, more or less, including the shares I picked up in the rights issue. Um, you know, not nice, but you know, I, I certainly don't stress it in that sense. Um, tax, uh, absolutely tax. Ah, Astoria, Bevan, 100%. Astoria, um, that's... That's my mind went blank on that one. There's another one. There's another one. It's going to kill me. Um, certainly, Astoria sits in my second tier. I know how to solve this problem. Uh, forget Google. Let's go to the website. Because I was on the wireless on, on Friday, and I spoke about them, and I could name them off the top of my tongue without any thought or concern or worry. Uh, Okay, no, Bevan, you're 100%. Sorry, my, my bad. You probably went and checked my website, didn't you? Uh, there it is. So what stocks did I do on? on? Hmm. Okay, not important. Um, so does the story as my second here. Yep, 100%. So tax, we pay tax. Uh, tax is essentially a byproduct of success. You pay 15% dividend tax. Nothing we can do about that. We pay CGT on exits. Um, I don't stress it. You know, I exited my MTNs last year at 173 Rand and some change. 
And up to my average entry on, on MTN was probably uh, 40 bucks a shot. So I've got a ton load of tax. I've got the, the first 40,000 and the rest I pay you know, a third of, of marginal rate. Um, but you know, tax is just a byproduct of success. So MTN, I mean, I didn't, you know, I, I decided I hated them. I, I decided I didn't like them. I'm not, you know, but you're going to hit it sometimes. Yeah. And, and maybe you're selling at a loss. Maybe you're selling at a profit. But, you know, I'm never going to make a decision to exit a share and say, oh, no, tax liability. Um, the M10 is a tax liability. I mean, fortunately for me, the M10s were in my wife's name. Uh, she's a student. So the CGT is suitably modest. Um, and I haven't told her yet. Uh, but I, I don't stress tax. You know, we're going to pay it. Nothing we can do about it. We can't avoid the tax. So, hey, we just pay it and, and life goes on. What I don't do, and, and, and this is not always going to be practical, but it has not it has worked so far, um, is I don't pull money out of the portfolio. So let's say I say MTN, let's say I've got a 20 grand tax bill. I try not to pull the 20 grand out of the portfolio to pay the tax. I find the 20 grand somewhere else to pay the tax. Uh, some questions coming through. Let's hit some of those. Adam, why not substitute Billiton with Mondi? You know, that's not a bad shout. Um, Mondi, on a global level, is considered a commodity stock for a start. Uh, done incredibly well. Um, Mondi, hey? Eh? So, Adam, I'll tell you why not, because I've never delved into Mondi. I hold it in my momentum portfolio. I have it various different times, but I've never delved into it. I need my pen because I need to make notes here. So, uh, Adam, like that, I'm going to go have some some lookings at Mondi's. Let's work out what the three things are I love about it. Here's an important point. I'm going to come to it in a moment, so let's park it there. Uh, John, okay, so John, a bunch coming through there. I'll come to those in a second. Uh, Adam, profit margin, 20%. Five years, HEPs growth, 20%. Yeah, I, I mean, an absolute stonker of a stock. Um, there was a point there when they were bigger than Anglo, and remember, they got spun out of Anglo, so that you know, the child overtook the parent. Now, we do that in generational theory, but you don't expect it to happen in, in, in that sort of environment. So, yeah, I uh, appreciate it. I will go and have some hard looks at Mondi. Um, so then some comments came through from Terence. Really, really great comments. Uh, the first was... Um, so in which shares do you fit the ETFs and you mentioned you're happy to hold 13, no more, but in fact, I hold lots more. In, in, in truth, I hold lots more. So, I mean, if we just go to this page here, um, 13, 16 shares, uh, another 15 down here takes me to 31. Um, but when I say 13 shares, I'm particularly focusing on those folks there who make up 30% of my portfolio. Um, so I'm, it's, it's absolutely a focus on, on, on those there. I do, in truth, then have my, my second tiers, I then have my momentums. What I also have is all of these. So for example, core shares equal weight 40 is another 40 shares. US is 600, world is 1600. Um, the Divi, which I've hardly got any left is 30. Uh, Satrix 40 is another 40. I've got, I don't know, approaching 2000 shares in total, but I separate them out. Those ones are sitting in my core portfolio. My ETFs sit there. Uh, then it's my death dress part, my second tiers, my trading strategies. So there is, in truth, a lot more stocks than, than just 13. But I'm focusing on this part of the of the portfolio. So it is that 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 concept of of the ETFs. They're completely separate. And, and the reason for the ETS is deadly simple. The biggest risk to my portfolio is not Brexit or Yellen or Putin or Trump. The biggest risk is me, that I go and buy Cumber at 600 and don't ever sell it, or Anglo Platinum at 1500 or African Bank at 40 or and so the list goes on. Um, so the ETS are there to give me base market performance. And then from base market performance, I then say, well, cool, let's now go try and, and beat this market um, with a small death dress part long-term portfolio, with an even smaller uh, short-term portfolio, uh, my second tiers. And although I call them short-term, I've held Colgro probably for five years. I've held Santova for probably two. I remember I once held Grinrod for probably five or six years, easy enough. And then my trading one's right at top. Um, Lizette says uh, DivTrax as opposed to Satrix Divi, 100%, absolutely 100%. So, so side tangent here, but Lizette, you couldn't be more right if you, you – yeah. the Satrix Divi is a busted concept. This problem with Smart Beta, which Satrix Divi is, and it was the first one in South Africa, the problem with Smart Beta is that what happens when Smart Beta is stupid? 
And with respect to Satrix, the Satrix Divi is stupid beta. It's not smart beta. Um, so I've been selling it down. The reason I've got a couple left is I'm writing an article for Finweek, uh, and I, it, it's always difficult. I, wanna, I don't want to front run myself. So while I'm writing the article, until such time as it's published, I don't sell. And I'd meant to write that particular article back in February or March, but I just keep on putting it off because there's other things to write about. And, uh, and, 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 yeah. and I hate sticking it to people. Yeah, I like Satrix, but you know what? It's a busted ETF. So the switch will be directly out of Satrix Divi and into the DivTracks from CoreShares, 100%. Um, okay, so let's run to some comments uh, from Thomas. So as I said, I only want 10 to 12 stocks, ideally out of the 500 listed. What am I actually doing? I am looking for reasons to not buy stocks. I look at a stock and I'm looking for a single flag that says don't buy it. And then I immediately just move on. You know, I, 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 there's 500 shares and I want to own a handful of them. I, I, I don't need to stress this. I don't need to, 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 to own everything. So the comment here um, was someone saying, you know, what about medicals? And my, my concern around medical stocks is quite simply um, uh, 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 legislative risk. So, Around the world, there are challenges around the cost of, 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 of medical health. We see it in the U.S. You spend a fortune of, of the national budget. In South Africa, we've already had single exit pricing. Um, always a topic in, in, in the U.K. We're getting national health insurance locally. And that puts pressure on drug manufacturers. It puts pressure on, host, on, on hospitals. And I don't know how this is going to play out. I expect they're going to do perfectly fine in the process. And hospitals are nice in that they're kind of like hotels, but with two better parts than hotels. One being is that you're kind of forced to go there. You don't check in voluntarily. You're in a smash or your doctor sends you. And two, hopefully your medical aid or medical insurance pays because, um, man, you've been ripped off on those hospital nights. But So I'm looking for reasons to, you know, single reason. So medical. To me, I take the whole medical business and I say legislative risk. Thanks, but no. Exception being Aspen. Uh, I think, Johan, you were asking about Aspen there. Um, absolutely. So uh, Aspen would be would 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 be the one I would say. You know what? I'm happy with that. I, I sure. Um, yeah, I'd let's let's look at some Aspen stocks there. I, I looked at Aspen when it was about two rand a share um, because, of course, Durban Company took over uh, SA Druggist uh, about 20 odd years ago for about 50 cents, if I recall. Um, but in the medical space, to me, it's just uh, 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 Aspen. And a quick point here. This is very much my thinking and my philosophy. And I'm no way saying that I'm right. I'm just saying this is me. You know, time will tell. Um, you know, we come back in 20 or 30 years and we can say if I'm right or not, but I'm not, I'm not even trying to be right. I mean, so, you know, in many senses, I'm, I'm as befuddled and, 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 and intimidated by the market as the next person. And I'm just trying to find those stocks, which I think I can put my faith in and that I can sleep well at night and, and come back for a long, you know, come back after a long time and find they've done great things for me. Um, so if I see something that concerns me, Typically, I just move on because I need to narrow that 500 list of stocks. Otherwise, I end up with with a bunch. I mean, we have a lot of really, really great ma management. Uh, MediClinic is, is is great management. Make no bones about it. Um, but is it is it is it that yeah, should I be concerned? I don't know. So I move on. A um, couple of others coming through. Some com comments from Daniel, and, and these were quite chunky. I'm not going to delve into them. I'm going to touch them a bit. But So he says, yeah, Porter's Five Forces, lacquer. And then he says, what about the SWOT analysis? Um, so SWOT, in my sense, kind of fits in. When I do a Porter's Five Forces, I'm kind of doing a SWOT already. Um, and, and he's 100%, for example, Discovery. I mean, massive strength, massive opportunity for them. The pestle I've, I've used before in, in various uh, 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 circumstances and the like. Um, and I kind of, I, I, so I'm going I'm to dig into it. My sister is a uh, facilitator and, and she's a boffin on pestle. So I'm going to see her in, in, in uh, next month. I'm going to get her to go through that with me. Boston Consulting Group Portfolio Matrix. I must say I'd never heard of it of it before. Um, so I need to dig into that as well. I'm not averse to this in the least, and I, I really appreciate Daniel spending you know, sending me a really chunky email. Um, I, I and I'm not so the overlap. Yeah, I. I, I I worry about trying to overcomplicate a process, and I'm not saying this does. And on the surface, this looks like it actually enhances a process. Um, and I quite like 
I, I do think that Porter's Five Forces could do with a little more enhancement and with a little more structure, perhaps. I worry that there's not enough structure to my process and thinking. It's too, you know, if I'm having a bad day and got a headache, maybe I'm going to hate everyone and I don't like any of the 500 shares. Um, you know, if someone just bought me a, 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 you know, a case of, of Japanese whiskey, well, then suddenly, a man, you can give me any dog and I'll love it. Um, so I, I worry that, but I'm going to I'm going to delve into this further. I, I had a look at, at Boston Consulting Group um, from when Daniel sent it, and, and certainly there's there's a lot to be said there. Um, and then, of course, he touched on, on Porter's as well. As I said, I don't want to uh, jump into this. Um, I think they're actually a valuable uh, uh, session entirely on their own. So let's delve into these. So Daniel jumps onto uh, JC, and I can see, I see Fumani, you've got JC there. I think, you, no, you didn't, uh, someone, oh, sorry, Shirley, you had it as well. So JSC, I, I do think threat of new entrants, uh, we're getting those new entrants. Uh, Zar X is coming um, and others. If we look at other markets, if we look at Europe, if we look at Australia, if we look at America, the, the new entrants have done fairly well. And in fact, in Australia, it's a Chinese entrant and they've got about a, I don't know, a quarter, one third market share. But our market is really, really tiny. I I'm not convinced these new entrants can make a significant dent to the JSC. And if they do, it's going to take a long time. And make no mistake, the ASX in, America, in, in Australia still does incredibly well, absolutely does well. Um, so, yeah, uh, Swat and Pet, they had strong leadership. Nikki Newton King, I think she'll be gone in the next couple of years, but she is strong. She has a very strong system around her. Those legacy systems are a problem. Uh, they're also an opportunity in a sense. So they've got T plus three going. Nice. It's two years late, but they delayed it for reasons. Um, but we still run on BDA, uh, broker dealer account, which most of you folks don't know about. But D BDA is literally the engine which runs the JSC, and it is literally DOS. I mean, it is not that it is old and antiquated. It is, it is DOS. And they have on a number of times tried to upgrade it and frankly failed. I think they're probably going to look at it again. I bumped into one of the uh, JC CEOs at Business Day TV on, it must have been Monday evening when I was there, uh, asking her, do we ever get to T plus zero? Because that's what Zarex is raving about. And then BDA. Um, and, and to be honest, they grimaced when I said BDA. It desperately needs. But JC is a cash cow. It absolutely is a cash cow. And that cash cow is probably just going to get bigger and bigger. And, and frankly, the threat might not be the biggest concern in the world. So, so the JSC is, is one I'm going to look at. Um, and probably I'm going to add it to my Mondi list to have a look at as well. Um, because it's certainly, it's got a lot of what we're looking for um, in terms of, of, you know, if we just quickly go back to this chart here. That one. So bargaining power of suppliers, pretty much zero. Threat of substitute products. Substitute products, no, but threat of new entrants, yes. And also international. You know, I think we're going to start seeing people trading on, on global platforms, um, whether they're locally global, like we've seen the white labels locally, or whether we physically go offshore, I'm not sure. Uh, bargaining power of customers, that's us, that's the brokers. So what we're seeing, some brokers are, are basically talking about giving back their broker licenses and going the route of um, uh, FSP to, 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 to walk away from it. Yes, but the JC still makes a lot of money. Competitive rivalry, you want that rivalry because what the rivalry does is stop entrance coming in. Um, and we've seen, you know, lazy balance sheets, the entrants do come in. So we'll see how that plays out. Um, but certainly the JC is someone who can who can make that space, I think. I think they can certainly uh, well worth a, a look through um, in, in that sense there. And I'm comfortable, you know, I want to find out number of stocks, but I think I can, I'm happy to push it. I'm not completely unhappy to push it. A comment came through, what about Steinhoff, Johan, you're also asking about Steinhoff. I like their business model. I can see what they're doing with it. I can see where they're going with it um, in terms of Europe, in terms of low cost. Their final, they've put in, together an offer for Poundland. Uh, it fits into the market they target. It's going to fit well with their Conferama. They make in the cheap Eastern Europe. They sell in the, I mean, they get better prices in Western Europe. They're going to compete with IKEA. They've got a massive property portfolio. They've still got a lot of SA assets. I think they will break the company up uh, into two parts. One will be Steinhoff Europe. One will be Steinhoff Africa um, and, and, and et cetera, et cetera. My concern with Steinhoff is management. And my concerns are a couple. So, you know, 
a number of times when they don't bother to issue a sense announcement, they do an update on their website. To my mind, that's a breach of the JC rules. Um, when they got raided by the German tax authorities and told us six days later. Okay, so two of those days were were weekend, but they neglected to tell us. The complexity of, of the structure and the balance sheet and the debt and the profit, whereby smart CAs I know look at it and just can't unravel it. And for me, that's always been my deal breaker. Um, there it is, John, thanks, uh, SNH. That's right, because of course they changed. Um, so to me, it's always been, you know, and, and the point with management, with Marcus Euster and his team, is that they have knocked it out the park plus a whole bunch more. Um, and that's, you know, but the, so, 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 so either I'm wrong or they're managing to, 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 to uh, uh, keep it under wraps. And I, I, I'm not calling them crooks. I'm just saying I ha we have concerns is, is, is the point. And, and, and so therefore, as I said, I'm looking for a single reason. They're a great company. They've done great. They're earning pounds. They're going to, you know, they're doing great in Europe. They really are taking on IKEA. But for me, I look at them and I say, you know what, guys? Yeah, but for me, thanks, but uh, not convinced. Adam, I'll come to yours in a bit. Yeah, so so John, to your point that they they closed a deal today with Poundland, uh, and and they're still processed, but let's assume that they do. You know what? I quite not unhappy. So uh, that's a, far too many negatives. I'm not unhappy that they walked away from the other deals because so the risk is particularly when you get into a bidding war, you overpay, right? So what they did is they like no line in the sand. You know, forget ego. We're going to walk away. So a couple of things happened. Firstly, they forced their competitor to overpay. Man, that's sneaky, sneaky, sneaky. That's Marcus Yuster through and through. Um, and, and maybe that's partly why I worry about it. Maybe he's just like really, really clever at it. And so I misconstrue some of that cleverness. So he makes his competitor overpay. And then he makes a profit on the shares because they've built up a stake and now someone else is going to buy them. So, you know, the walking away, I think, is great. Eventually, you've got to do a deal. And it seems that with Poundland that they that they absolutely have uh, or are looking like they're going to be making a deal. Uh, and then uh, Breit, uh, not to be confused with British American Tobacco. Uh, so Breit is a stock that I, I actually have a fair limited amount of knowledge on it. I mean, I do know it. I, uh, it's Costa Visa, of course. Um, they've got some great UK assets. We can certainly see them move into the UK. He's an absolute deal maker. Quick question. Someone said, does Stanhoff buy ShopRite? They might if they break the company in half put the shop right in the in the local side, in the South African part, and then keep the rest into Europe. Um, Breit is, is, is one of those ones I have gone. So if we go back in the day uh, to, was it 09, maybe 2010, uh, Breit was, was basically a private equity play. Um, and they fundamentally shifted their business model. Uh, and they've done it incredibly well. They've absolutely made it work. And they've got really, really great assets in the space. And the short answer, why not Breit? There's no good reason, except that you know there's probably at the end of the day more stocks that I can hold. Um, but 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 Breit is 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 uh, Breit's a really really good company. Uh, John, I agree. Poundland's a, a warm up deal in a sense, and I think with the collapse and with the whole Brexit thing, um, I think as soon as the Poundland deal is half set down, they will suddenly rush off and do it. So Breit is certainly one I think that that does uh, deserve some some more attention. And I'm not going into it in detail, detail here, because what I'm doing is I'm making lists of these different shares. We've got three now, Mondi, JC, and Breit. And then I want to go through that whole process in a webinar on its own with just a handful of stocks that we can really, really pull apart and see if they if they meet the, the qualifying criteria in a sense. Um, Samuel was saying, what about education stocks? Uh, and yeah, I mean, education, Absolutely. There's a bunch of stats around it. Firstly, you know, research globally and even locally in South Africa will show you that people are prepared to give up a lot before they 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 uh, prejudice their children's education. Um, you know, they will they will cut and reduce insurance policies, maybe even downgrade DSTVs and hamburgers and pizza takeaways and the like. Education is 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 you know, one of the cornerstones of our society. It's how you know each generation gets better than the previous because of that education. Um, so really, in South Africa, two stocks, uh, Advertech and 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 Cura. Um, and my pick would probably be Advertech. But so I went through the Advertech process a number of years ago before Cura arrived. Um, and they failed in the sense that it was lazy management. They were kind of sitting pretty. You know, we've got penetration of private schools in this country that is on global standards, you know, a third of global standards. 
And Advertech were kind of doing nothing with it. Um, and I was like, come on, guys, really? Uh, you know, get, get it together. And they weren't. And they've got that little recruitment business. And I know what they talk, you know, the, the colleges and the like, then shuffle into the recruitment business. I'm not convinced by that either. I just, Advertech really, really weren't a great stock. And then Kuro came and Kuro just shook them up 100%. Um, I currently hold Kuro in my momentum portfolio, losing money in it, so be it. Um, and then the question is, which? So Kuro's got all the growth prospects and the like. There's some concerns around Kuro I have. Fast growing is risk. Um, they keep on saying one thing and doing another. If you go back to their initial plans, you know, 20 schools by 2020, and now it's 40 schools by 2020. Every time they do a rights issue, they say, you know, no more rights issues. And then, of course, they do more rights issues. Um, PSG behind them is undoubtedly a big deal. Yanni Matan and the PSG family do not, I mean, they, don't, they, they haven't yet got it wrong. I mean, maybe we could call Zeta their failure. If Zeta is your failure in life, you've got no worries whatsoever. You know, Capitech, PSG Consult, and others. Um, so my pick would probably be Advertech in this space. I need to go dig them again. The other thing with Kira is, is too new and too much on the J-curve of the hockey stick. So in other words, I'm not unhappy to own them, but I want them in my second tier portfolio. I'd want them to grow into uh, the, the the main portfolio before I, I, I go and get it. Um, and then others. So let's run through some thoughts here that folks have got. Uh, John, the other one that you touched on, uh, PSG not there. So PSG, yes, and I own it in my death dress, in my uh, momentum portfolio. The question with PSG is, do we not perhaps buy the pieces? i.e. Capitech uh, uh, and, and Kira, or do we buy PSG because they're going to find the next amazing stock? You know, they've got two out-and-out -out winners, and if they get a third one, you already benefit from that third one. So you've got the direct Mouton family. And I've always taken the view that I will buy the bits and pieces. I, I don't like Zeta. Um, PSG Consult, nice, but nothing frantically exciting about it now they're both very small in the psg space uh, i've got capitech so i could in a sense swap capitech out and put psg in but i really really want the capitex so i like that space there and i like the low cost banking uh, credit cards home loans all those bits that are going to come down the line from capitech make me not want to sell my capitex and then if i buy a psg then i'm doubling up too much because what about 40 50 percent of psg is capitech uh, what else we got here? The J curve of the hockey stick. I tell you, Raymond, that's what it feels like sometimes. So I mix my metaphors there. I merge two together, J curves and hockey sticks. But I tell you what, it, 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 it looks like it. And at some point, you know, the trick with stocks like, like, like Kira, I mean, they're impossible to value. They're absolutely impossible to value. So you basically just got to close your eyes and buy them. Um, and, and to me, as I said, there would be a second tier and, and, and time may uh, uh, move into it. But that point is they're just growing exponentially fast and they're managing it. And the beauty is because they're held by PSG, PSG has experience in that exponentially fast growth. They did it with Capitec. They know different fields, but they understand the challenges you're going to run into. They're going to understand all those issues. So if anyone can do it, it's PSG and, 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 their, t and their team. Uh, Capco, John, yeah, so Capco. So, I mean, I was saying to folks in Finweek, I was saying, buy Capco, uh, mid-60, 70 bucks, buy Capco. Someone mailed me and said, but what happens if Brexit happens? And I replied, Brexit's not going to happen, buy Capco. Well, I was wrong. Uh, Brexit did happen, and we shouldn't have bought Capco. We should have waited for Brexit to happen. The point being, and I was on Stockwatch last night, I mean, basically, UK property is in a really, really tough space. Um, but, I, you know, Capco is the, the what's the analogy? It's the bee's knees or the queen's diamond or something like that. Um, and and, 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 and you know, they own Covent Garden and Earl's Court. Two of the, you know, the cliches are not making any more property anymore. Indeed, they're not. But, you know, we can always expand cities. You know, Joburg is expanding in, in every direction. Um but the center of London is not expanding. It is there. So there's going to be some pressure on that, you know, potential British recession, et cetera, et cetera. But you are buying Capco. You are getting what must be you know, two of the best properties in the world. If, if we put a list together of the top 10 property properties in the world to own, 
you know, are, are if, if Covent Garden and Earl's Court aren't on that top 10 list, they're bubbling just under. So, you know, and at the <clears throat> 50, 55 rand, I don't know where they're close today. Uh, they're offering great value, but, you know, more weakness in the pound is going to hurt. Um, you know, they, they might stick around here for a while. They might dub, go uh, sub 50 again. The Z storage. Yes. So I had a, a strong, hard look when their results came out. I'll be honest, I was looking at a reason to poke them, um, and I couldn't find one. Um, you know, it, it's a good business model. It's a very different business model. It's a very uh, 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 nice model in the fact that storage works when people are moving up in the world. Storage works when people are moving down in the world. Storage works in boom times. Storage works. <clears throat> it works in boom times because you buy a new lounge suite and you don't want to get rid of the old lounge suite because it was granny's favorite. So you stick it in storage. Uh, in the bad times, you doing storage because things are going south and your salary is under threat or maybe you're a train, you know, you smaller house, you know, maybe granny's now living with you and she bought her lounge suite. So that sort of thing. So storage certainly is attractive to me. Again, too new to go into my death dose part, but certainly possible that it could go into a, a, a second tier portfolio. What you note on my second tier portfolio is it's very light on stocks at the moment. There are currently three in there. So there's a chunk of cash. Typically in that second tier, I've got five or six stocks. Um, and storage is one of them I, I, I went and had a look at. Um, I wanted to dislike them, and I couldn't find a single reason. So um, yeah, John, Covent Garden is never going to lose its value. Uh, the question is their ability to 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 profit off that in the short term, and and that is without doubt going to be harder, but it's not losing its value. I mean, Covent Garden, the value goes up post Brexit. Covent Garden is more valuable because Brexit is now what three weeks old, whatever it is. Uh, it ain't going absolutely nowhere. Um, yeah, there, Mark Twain. Uh, thanks for money. Buy land. They're not making it anymore. They're absolutely not. Uh, Raynet. I'm going to have to pass on. It's just a stock that I have. Never, I, I looked at it a long, long time ago and have never really, really gone back to it. Uh, so, Shimon, I'm sorry, but Raynet, just one of those. I'm not uh, smart enough. Sam Falls caught 100%. And now here come all the questions about EOH. And I, so, Asha Bohart is, I mean, he's, he's done a monster, monster thing. He's done incredibly well. Has he not? I worry about tech generally. I, you know, look at Pokemon Go and now everyone's selling Facebook because apparently Pokemon Go is the new social net media. It's not a social, but there's, 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 uh, Ash has really done a good job in putting it together. The valuations have come back. His challenges, his growth has been typically half organic and half acquisitive. The acquisitive becomes harder and harder to do. Um, his other challenge comes, other companies coming up who are mimicking him, which Subu Shabalala at Adapt IT is absolutely, yeah, Subu Shat sat down, looked at what Asher did and said, hmm, I can do the same. Started with InfoWave, which they spun out of uh, Elova. It was the IT for Elova. And, and off it goes. Um, that's fine. Competition is actually a good thing rather than a bad thing. Um, so EOH is, is, is certainly one that could be on there. Jade Adapt IT, again, because of its, of its newness and the like, would have to go into a second tier. Adapt IT is on my shopping list. It's the stock I want to buy. Uh, I just want it a lot cheaper, and I can't remember where my bid is. But last time I checked, the stock was approximately double what my bid was. So Adapt IT is definitely on my on my shopping list in that space there. Um, what about specific reasons? Oh, so, okay, Adam, why don't I have global equities? So I don't have global equities because I don't know where to start. I, I you know. So I know a lot about the JC, although I don't know everything. I, I, there's, you know, the, the, as I said, I forgot the Steinhoff code, and, and Raynet is one that passes me by. And the, the stocks now, I see the sense, and it's like, I didn't even know this company existed. And, and in my defense, they're small little companies, but still. Um, so I, I cheat. I, you know, I said to myself, I'm the ex, I'm not the expert. I'm an expert in the South African space. That's a cool place to be. I'm happy with it. In the US, I'm going to get my exposure via the ETFs. Um, and globally, I'll get my exposure by uh, Richmond in, in, in Europe and Asia and, and America and China and the like. Uh, ShopRite moving into Africa. So I get my exposure that way. Uh, taste Holdings, um, if you hold for 50 years. Dude, I'm too old for 50 years. Um, I mean, even if I live another 50 years, by then I'm not going to be able to drink my coffee or eat my pizza. I don't have any teeth left. Uh, so... so Taste gets interesting. 
the pullback from when it hit five rand and change was completely made sense. Uh, the two rand audit currently trading at, which is below the uh, uh, the recent rights issue, completely makes sense. I have a lot of respect for Carlo Gonzaga. I still don't agree with his jewelry arm, um, except that the point being is that his jewelry arm is currently saving their butt, so nice, uh, and they're, they're, they're good business. Uh, you know, my wife had to get a wedding ring repaired, which we bought at the Toll Wholesale Jewelers, and there was uh, we paid for it. It cost six grand, but, you know, no problem, no sweat, no issues. They did it. It was nice and simple. Um, the trick is two things. They're taking the eye off the other brands. I mean, when Carlo talks two things these days, Domino's and, and Starbucks, of course, but their core business is currently other brands. So they're converting the pizzas. But what about their fish and chips? What about their maxis? We've, what about their, their, their Zambos that they bought, which was the open uh, flame grilled chicken? Um, so there's the risk with that part. And they've still got to prove that these big brands work. South Africa certainly has an appetite for global brands. You know, we, we see that in KFC and McDonald's in the long term. We see it shorter term in, in other brands that have come in. Um, but they, they're tough, they're expensive, they, we, we, I'm not saying it's not going to work, I just think it could be a long time, uh, and, and it could be a long process, and there might be another rights issue. So taste for now is we will wait and see. Uh, Raymond, a view on monopolies versus oligopolies versus competitive industries. So I like competitive industries as a rule. Because a competitive industry, no one wants to come in and, and, and get involved in. You know, people look at it and say, Oosh, no, you know, really, do we want to go try compete with ShopRite and those folks at those margins? No, we're not going to try. Um, so I, I, I intuitively like competitive industries. A good old-fashioned monopoly, if possible, is a, is a thing of beauty. And we're seeing fewer and fewer of them coming through, or even oligopolies. Oligo oligo uh, Multi monopolies, um, you know. So the JC sits there, or those that Nicky Newton King will tell you they're just a single license operator. They're not a monopoly. They did buy out all the competition, being Suffix and the Bond Exchange. Um, a monopoly that can protect its monopoly. So an example would be the telcos, uh, you know, MTN, Vodacom, etc. How do they protect it? It costs is not going. There are currently four telcos in South Africa, uh, in, in the mobile space. Ecosta is not going to issue a fifth license. It's just not going to happen. So, what is that that moat to the monopoly? Is always the question for me. Uh, John, fish and chips is absolutely a mess. I, I used to eat the fish and chips down the road from me. This is fish and chips co, which is taste. It was it was crazy cheap. I think for fifty two rand, I got more fish and chips than me and my wife could eat, and two uh, Pepsi's, and it was really, really good food. And the quality just dived. And and the first trick they did was they delayed how long they changed the oil. So you start getting very old oil, which makes for you know. And I mean, just it just has it, it yeah. And then the hake prices went up, so their prices weren't so great, and food wasn't so great. And so there were two near me, and both were subsequently closed down. So now everyone's asking about uh, Blue Label, Fumani, uh, Lizette. Uh, they sponsored the box. So they should have sponsored the – so that was weird. But it was just for the the Irish test. I, I, I don't know. You know, if, if you're Absa, I can get it. But if you're Blue Label, I'm not sure why. So Blue Label, um, the, the Levy brothers, um, names escape me. Yeah. They got a great business. I mean, they absolutely have. I know Keith McLachlan's a big fan of them. So what do they do? They sell you virtual things, right? They sell you initially virtual airtime, then they're selling you virtual electricity. But let's look at our economy globally going forward. More and more and more is coming virtual. Massively large amounts more. What I don't get is why they aren't here transferring money around, and that might be a security risk where I could go to my local Blue label point of service at my engine here and ship money to someone in, in Cape Town instantaneously. Uh, and maybe there's legislative issues and maybe stuff around with that. Um, but that virtualness and what they've got, they've got the software and the software is you know, nothing massively fancy there. They kind of went a little loose a couple of years ago, but they've worked out what they really, really do. And any new, if you come with a new product that can be sold virtually, they're the guys to speak to. They absolutely are. They give you an instant 
humongous distribution network. And I'm frantically trying to think what our next virtual product is, and I can't. But, okay, so an example. Um, you want to catch an Uber, but you don't have a credit card. So maybe you go and buy a, virtu a virtual Uber voucher at the, at, at, at the engine. Um, and I know there's also, you know, but, but, but you hear what I'm saying? I mean, it's that. So Blue Label, absolutely, I think, is, 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 is certainly one that, that can do a, a heck lot. Others, uh, John, BTI. Yeah, so I used to own BTI. I bought it because it was way, way cheap, um, and then I sold it because it was way, way expensive. For that, I sold it at about six hundred, and it's gone to the moon without me. So be it. Not happy about it, but nothing I can do. Yeah, and I bought it knowing that this was not a stock I could death to us part because, man, it, you know, smoking. There's going to be a time in this planet when you, you, know, you did what? We're already seeing it where in Australia, if you're born before one January 2000, it's illegal for you to smoke. So they're creating a generation of non-smokers. Tasmania wants to ban smoking on the entire state. Uh, New Zealand has discussed banning smoking in New Zealand in its entirety. So smoking is moving from the west to the east, and soon enough, the east catches up and smoking will disappear underground completely. Um, Bidvest, Bidcorp interests me. Uh, Bidvest, yes, I haven't really delved into them. Industrial conglomerates, to me, there's just too many moving parts, and you just get too much of an average. When they get too big, There's, you know, you can just never really, really move the dial. So unbundling, perhaps a little bit more interesting in that space. Uh, for Monica, that was Blue Label as well. Um, Local property, so yeah, so uh, John, local property, 100%. Here's my disclaimer on local property. I just never, so, so back in the day, let's go right back to the 80s and 90s. There was hardly any local property. It was boring as sin. It did, you know, it, it, it basically went up by inflation, by, by you know, the inflation every year. They traded at discount to net asset values and the like. And then we had the massive boom that happened. Um, and, and literally we went, at one point, they weren't, so the SAPI, 20 is the property index, South African property index, and it has 20 stocks in that index. And at one point, there weren't 20 listed property stocks. There were not 20 listed property stocks. Now we've probably got close to 100. Uh, a lot of rats and mouse, you know, a lot of rats and mouse. But I never really, really kept up with it. My pick and property locally is high prop. Um, quality, high end, really, really like it. But I cheat on property and do the uh, ETF. And it just occurred to me, why isn't that ETF reflected there? Huh. Oh, because it was on my... S because I sold the one and I'm switching into the other and obviously the trade hasn't happened. Okay. I uh, don't... So, 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 so I, I've gone and PropTrax 10 is my preferred in that space there. Um, and then it really is a case of... And then, and then it, would be, it would be high prop. Nepi, Capco, although they're global players rather than, than, than local players. Listed locally, of course. Um, so as I said, uh, so no gold shares, no nope, gold shares are trade. Uh, I think gold might go to 1500. I'm not sure, but gold stocks are not death to us part. Gold stocks are, are, are buy and hold. I have, uh, three gold stocks. I have, um, dum, 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 dum. Where are they? I have Goldfields, I have Sabanya, and I have Anglo Gold Ashanti. Where's Anglo Gold Ashanti on that list? Oh, there it is there. So, but I hold those. Those are on my my death, my, my momentum. As long as they're going, I hold them. Uh, if they stop going, not so keen. For money, uh, mixed tell, mixed tell, mixed telematics, um, and more than protect your car. So when I last chatted to the CEO, which was a couple of years ago, they were making little things that you could put on your bicycle. Which sounds silly, but hey, those bicycles are worth 70, 100, 150K. Suddenly tracking devices on there, tracking devices on your cameras, uh, tracking devices on everything else. Um, they were, and what's nice is their R&D is Stellenbosch, Rand's cheap, so globally. Um, the other is CarTrack, which I wasn't particularly inspired with. Um, but it was always a second tier, and I've never delved that much deeper into it. Um, no, John, look, I'm loving the gold. It's the first time in my life I have owned, owned a gold share. Literally. I mean, first time ever I've owned a gold share. I own three. I wasn't a happy camper buying them. Um, and my Anglo Gold Ashanti is up 40 or 50%. You know, it's just like it's the weirdest feeling in the whole world. So to the point, I actually want a few stocks. I want that concentration risk, and I want the absolute best. And I'm happy to pass on stocks for what might be frivolous meat reasons. I might say to you, yeah, you know what, that Steinhoff, they don't publish their stuff on cents. Um, not going to buy them. And you're looking at me and thinking, you're crazy, so-and-so. Steinhoff is printing money. Marcus Just is a genius, and everyone's going to get rich except me. And you're probably right on every point. Um, but the thing is, is that there are more quality stocks in the JC than I can hold in my portfolio. I want a dozen. 
there, there's there's two or three dozen. So I start to get ruthless. And the fact that we disagree on things is exactly why stock markets work and 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 and, and the like. That that is absolutely the beauty of it. Uh, ladies and gents, we massively hit our time. Um, I really appreciate it. this has been this has been huge fun. I hope it was fun for you. Um, I, I'm going to do it again from time to time. Um, and I'm going to go look. We've got Mondi, we've got JSC, we've got uh, BAT um, as my absolute biggies for the death to us part. Um, and maybe we bin a bulletin and a sassel for either or both or all three of them. Uh, storage, I'm going to go have a deeper look at. And blue, I'm going to go have another look at. As I said, ra radiant, I'm going to look at just because I need to know more about it. It's, you know, it's, it's a weird stock. It flies under the radar. Um, MTN, yes. So MTN comes back into my radar, John, when two things happen. First off, I need the new management team in place. I need the new corporate culture to be evident. And this is going to take a while. That CEO is not here until next year. That's going to take a while. And then I need the shakeout to happen. And the shakeout is that MTN becomes a utility. And the fact that we buy tons of data at incredibly cheap prices and they make a whoop amount of profit. I mean, that giga data they sell me, how much does it cost them to produce that giga data? Zero. Yes, CapEx. I get the CapEx. But ultimately, data is a utility like water and electricity. Difference. It costs money to purify water and it costs money to make electricity and move it around. Um, so MTN comes back. But I think it's probably at least five years. And, and so I need that management to be to become evident. Um, and, and it might be Vodacom. Um, and then I need it to be, come into a utility and for the market to price it as a utility, which means a low double-digit PE. Uh, Raymond, absolute pleasure. Had a huge amount of fun. Uh, John, yep, 100%. So I'm going to come back. Yeah, I'm thinking we can do this, I don't know, every so often or so. I don't want to, you know, overdo it and then it becomes just a, a, a boring thing for everybody. But, you know, review the portfolio so often. Let's pick up on those others. So my next thing is I'm going to go take Mondi, JC, and, and, and Brait, and I'm going to pull them apart in 100 different ways. Let's do a webcast on them, um, and and we will announce with the webcast what the stocks are. So, and we can go and have a look, see, and we can you know do this sort of in a sense, I suppose, collectively. In, in a sense, some uh, uh, I think it was Sharon who said, you know, we, we we're almost kind of doing an investment club here, and and uh, absolutely we are. Um, the other thing where someone made a comment to me, because at the moment this is fairly one-ish way, we can make it a two-way fairly simple and that I can activate microphones. So, you know, if, if you've gone off and done a whole bunch of on digging on a certain aspect or something, we can bang your microphone on and we can have a proper discussion rather than a, a one-way uh, discussion. So, folks, I'm going to leave it there because my wine is cold. Well, wine is always cold. My wine is just sitting there gathering dust, and that's probably a crime. I, I really appreciate the time. I really appreciate the support, uh, not just you know generally for 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 just one lap, but also the support the even this evening. Um, you do something like this, and you hope that people come and ask questions. And well, true to form, people came and asked questions. Uh, really appreciate it. everyone. Have a grand evening. Further, cheers all. <laughs>